Hi Lorraine, how are you today? I'm good, thanks, Jürgen. How are you? I am very well, a little bit awkward because this is new to us. Uh, what we want to do here is we want to commence uh, a new podcast series, if you will. Uh, we'll start with a video podcast, aim high straight away. And what we want to do content-wise is we want to talk about some law topics. In our case, it'll be uh, international law, human rights issues, but also constitutional law. And um, we want to present this to our students here in the law school, but we also want to present it to a wider audience to see uh, if it might be interesting. If it is, it is. If it is not, uh, our main goal here is to have some fun. Exactly. So today for our starting podcast, uh, what we have been looking at as a topic is uh, the ongoing uh, conflict in Syria. And um, what we want to look at is issues arising from the use of force um, and to discuss the legality uh, around the issue of the use of force in the Syrian conflict. And obviously there are a huge number of international law questions that are raised by the conflict in Syria, but the one we wanted to focus on for this podcast was looking at the recent bombings in Syria by the United States, and in particular whether the actions authorised by President Trump were legal under international law. Indeed, uh, this conflict now spans over uh, almost 10 years, I think, uh, with the hot phase, the really hot phase, over five years, hundreds of thousands of people uh, are dead and or displaced, um, and uh, with effects not just in Syria, uh, but uh, across the borders uh, in the neighboring countries, uh, especially in Jordania, especially in Lebanon, uh, in, especially in Turkey, but beyond uh, part of the refugee crisis, of course, in the European Union was fueled by the Syrian conflict. So the Syrian conflict could fill law books in and by itself, and we'll look at these recent bombings. Well, when we look at use of force in public international law, I think the starting point is always Article 2, Section 4 of the Charter of the mm -hmm. United Nations, uh, which actually prohibits uh, the use of force as a starting point. And it's something that people don't really think about in modern times, but it's a huge shift in the world to actually have an international legal instrument saying that the use of force is prohibited. Uh, uh, I think you're quite right. It's a, a seismic shift. Uh, it took until it took two world wars, in effect, um, on, uh, and the founding of the United Nations. And I think um, the aim there is to uh, construe the international community of states in a similar fashion as the states themselves, because within the states themselves, the use of force is monopolized with the state. And only under very exceptional circumstances are the individuals within the state allowed to use force. Mm -hmm. And we'll see uh, as we talk about this that there are some similarities uh, with what uh, we want to achieve at the, uh, on the international plane by the United Nations. So what is it that uh, Article 2, Section 4 actually prohibits? Well, it's pretty simple. It prohibits the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any member state of the United Nations. So the starting position in relation to international law, and this applies to the Syrian bombings, is that the use of force by one state against another is prohibited. Right, and I think what we can say without uh, uh, going too much into details is um, uh, that quality restriction, or what sounds as a, as a qualitative restriction, uh, be directed against the political independence or the territorial integrity of another state, has actually in the interpretation of Article 2, Section 4, only played a minor role so mm -hmm. far. So the focus has been on what force, what constitutes force. Exactly. But it's quite clear in this case that launching missiles from one country towards another is enough to constitute Indeed. Force. I think uh, there can be no controversy around uh, that mm -hmm. element. Uh, when force is debated in Article 2, Section 4, it's often around economic force, embargoes, mm -hmm. blockades, sanctions, sanctions mm -hmm. and things like that. But that the use uh, uh, of, of uh, Moab, mm -hmm. the mother of all bombs, uh, um, uh, would constitute force, I think is uh, totally uncontroversial and can really not be the point of interpret interpretive uh, controversy in, in, in this case. So you'd agree there's a prima facie breach of Article 2.4, so we now have to look at the next step of whether the actions right. are 
allowed under any right. exceptions to Article 2. With my background, I wouldn't say there's a, a prima facie preach, <laughs> but uh, what, uh, uh, because that sounds as if you know uh, we have already uh, arrived at a result. No, but there is uh, force being potential used. Potential violation. It's, it's a potential violation. Mm -hmm. We now have to look at um, whether that use of force can actually be justified, mm -hmm. um, either under the terms of the United Nations Charter mm -hmm. or if possible or uh, uh, conceivable otherwise. Exactly. And I think uh, um, the starting point is relatively simple there as well. There are two mm -hmm. uh, uh, justifications in the United Nations Charter for, uh, the, for justifying the use of force. In other words, for uh, achieving a result that a particular use of force might have been legal after all. Indeed. And the first of those is that the Security Council can organise or can authorise the use of force under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. And the other is that the Charter recognises that states have an inherent right to self-defence. So we need to look at whether either of those might apply in this case. Right. So the second one is Article 51 of the Charter. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, if we start with the first one, um, is actually quite interesting. It involves the Security Council. Mm -hmm. And it actually gives the Security Council a vast powers mm -hmm. to determine um, whether to authorize force and if that force, uh, force is authorized by the Security Council then we have a justified exercise of force and therefore not a violation of Article 2 Section 4. And of course the Security Council can only do that if they judge that it's necessary to maintain international peace and security but within that phrase they have a really wide um, ambit or wide scope to move if they do see that there's a need. Indeed, Article 39 uh, limits that power of the Security Council to the determination that there be a threat or a breach of international peace and security. There's a bit of a debate on what kind of material limitation that gives to the Security Council. That could be subject to uh, a series of other podcasts right then and there. Mm -hmm. uh, but in our case, I think it's fair to say, and it's uncontroversial, uh, the Security Council has given no such authorization to the United States or anybody else for that matter to use force as a reaction to the alleged use of chemical weapons mm -hmm. uh, by the Syrian government uh, on parts of the Syrian population. Indeed, and you can see in certainly the statements by different senior leaders in the United States that one of their justifications for wanting to do this is that they felt the international community wasn't reacting quickly enough to events in Syria, so they took a leadership role in the matter. But fact remains, no authorization by the Security Council. Uh, we can even say uh, no chance for an authorization by the Security Council because um, the, uh, the Russians mm -hmm. um, and uh, probably the Chinese Indeed. were not um, willing and had indicated that uh, they wouldn't be willing to uh, sanction this and hence uh, we would have had a veto situation. Mm -hmm even if there had otherwise been a majority on the Security Council. Exactly. Now that leaves uh, good old self-defense in Article 51 uh, of the United Nations Charter, uh, which allows the use of force against an armed attack. Mm -hmm. So the question here that you have to ask right at the beginning is, was there an armed attack that the United States was reacting to or defending itself against? And when we talk about the justification for these bombings being the use of chemical weapons by the Syrian government allegedly against its own people, it's difficult to see how that could rise to the level of being an armed attack, at least in the way that phrase has traditionally been understood. Well, the first thing to say would be um, that the armed attack must be an armed attack outside and against a, another state, so exactly. outside of the territory of the state in question, exactly. and that a mere act of civil war doesn't meet the criteria. Within the borders does not meet the, bo uh, the, the criteria of an armed attack, mm -hmm. which I'm trying to, or which the country, in this case the United States, is uh, or might be trying to repel. Mm -hmm. So we have a problem right there uh, with the qualification of uh, the armed attack. Mm -hmm. Um, that is a bit different than what we had in the past. In the past, around this notion of armed attack, uh, there was a lot of discussion in Iraq and uh, preemptive strikes and, mm -hmm. and uh, all of that, the, the Bush doctrine of uh, taking care of matters before an attack has actually started. None of that is at issue here. 
Not um, part of the justification. Uh, of the whether abuse. this is part of the, uh, uh, can be part of the justification. And there's been an interesting discussion around self defence of whether a state can protect itself from a potential armed attack by a non state actor. But again, that doesn't really arise here because we allegedly have a government using the weapons against non-state actors, namely their own citizens. So the question's reversed in many, in many ways and simply doesn't arise. Indeed. So that was uh, discussed around the uh, uh, military, the use of force in Afghanistan, for example, mm -hmm. whether a self-defense situation um, can exist if not Afghanistan was acting but an autonomous, if you will, private group in Afghanistan at the time, uh, the Taliban. Uh, now here we have ISIS, which has a similar uh, type of setup as a non-state actor. Um, but uh, uh, there's a lot of controversy around that question. Uh, some people try to solve that question by attributing uh, the actions of the non-state actor to the state on which territory or from whose territory they are acting from. Mm -hmm whether it's inability to step in or whether it's unwillingness to step in. Um, others uh, uh, say, it, uh, or have a more narrow view and even say it needs to be a state actor. Um, mm -hmm. And so a non, you cannot have self-defense against a non-state actor. Um, again, a topic of a different podcast. But in this case, the United States haven't opened any of those doors because they've been quite clear in what they say has been the justification and the basis for this attack because they are quite clear in saying they believe, rightly or wrongly, that the Syrian government are responsible for the use of chemical weapons in this case and they're reacting in relation to that attack. So there can't really be any question of an armed attack against the United States here emanating from the Syrian government. Indeed. The only other avenue that one could even commence to think about not with a lot of persuasion, but anyway, at least discuss, is that the extent of what happened, namely the use of chemical weapons, is so bad mm -hmm. that it is equal in scale to an armed attack. That's an argument that's been brought forward in the context of humanitarian intervention a couple of times, that it, is, it equates to an armed attack. It's kind of like the same level of... Uh, but we would have to say, on the basis of... Of, of treaty interpretation, mm -hmm. it's just not there. Um, and it's a really important point that you've raised because when we're talking about is this an armed attack, we're not talking about is this a good or a bad thing to have happened. Obviously, this is a terrible thing, the use of chemical weapons against a population. So it's important to differentiate between the questions by saying an armed attack didn't occur here and there therefore may have been a prohibited use of force. You're not in any way saying that you think it's a good thing that chemical weapons are used or you're not unreservably um, condemning what actually happened. So you've got to divorce the legal consequences from perhaps the moral or political consequences of this. Indeed, action. that is very important. It's not condoning anything. At all. Um, at all. Um, it is just the question of do we have the legal parameters, do we have the legal conditions met for the use of force. So and it may be that even if the United States actions are seen to be in violation of international law, you can equally make a case that the Syrian actions in using chemical weapons are in themselves a violation of um, international law. But again, that would be a topic for another podcast. That would be it. But uh, uh, that leaves us with the result at this stage, perhaps still a preliminary result, mm -hmm of having to come to the conclusion uh, that under the Charter, uh, the American use of force by uh, bombing that particular airfield in response to the chemical attacks of the uh, Syrian government. And we are assuming at this point, um, and which would be a factual question, whether that attack is actually attributable to the Syrian government. Mm -hmm. Uh, but let's, if we just assume that for a moment, um, that uh, even if that is the case, uh, there is no justification in the United Nations Charter for the use of force as authorized by President Trump. And hence these actions are illegal under international law as our preliminary finding. However, maybe not entirely over. Maybe not, maybe entirely. not entirely over. Uh, because this result would actually have to stand as a final result, if the Charter exclusively and comprehensively uh, 
dealt with the question of the use of force. Mm -hmm. If, in other words, the Charter is what we in international law call a self-contained regime, mm -hmm. meaning, indeed, only the Charter is the template for asking the question and answering the question of whether use, uh, force is used legitimately or not. Mm -hmm. If one follows that proposition, and it is probably the leading proposition um, at the time um, that has the most support. Well, it was intended to be at the time. And it was certainly intended to be at the time. Uh, then the question is well and truly answered. Uh, that's the end of it. The use of this particular force was illegal. If, however, one thinks it is possible that there can be justification of the use of force outside this treaty framework that the Charter pr uh, presents, if, in other words, one could make a case that customary international law mm -hmm. might also provide additional justifications for the use of force, then we could open the case again and see if we can find something there. Mm. It's a hard case to make at the moment, though, because obviously for customary international law, you need to establish widespread and consistent state practice. So we'd need to demonstrate that states regularly intervene in these sorts of situations and use force, um, for example, when chemical weapons or other weapons are used against a civilian population. And that's a hard case to make because for every intervention like in Syria, you have a wide range of other cases where atrocities have been committed by governments against their own people and the international community has been extremely slow to react, if indeed they react at all. Uh, that, of course, uh, links it very closely to the general question that's discussed in that exact same framework of what we call humanitarian intervention mm -hmm. against cross violations of human rights, yes. where also uh, we usually come at wit's end with the Charter and therefore our only chance to defend, legally defend, such humanitarian intervention is to step outside of the Charter and discuss the, the possibility of justifying the use of force outside of the Charter with reference to customary international law where we need state practice. Mm. Now, and really it stems from countries looking at situations like this and thinking surely it can't be right for international law not to have an answer and to require us to sit back and do nothing. So this idea of humanitarian intervention has developed because states want to be able to go in and ensure that fundamental human rights are upheld, but really the United Nations Charter provides only a very difficult mechanism through requiring the Security Council. Which, of course, makes a lot of sense because what we usually do uh, when the factual situation tends to be heavily politicized, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even just factually controversial, nobody exactly knows um, how bad the situation is or does it already need force or does it not yet need force. When we have difficult situations like that, we resort to a procedure. Mm -hmm. Um, in order to legitimize our, our decision on which perhaps honest people, well-meaning people could be of different opinions. We resort to a procedure. Problem is, we have a procedure. It's the procedure in the Security Council. And um, the counter-argument that has been used against that is that the Security Council uh, is under a blockade, mm -hmm. therefore cannot actually discharge its functions. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that is an interesting uh, thought process, and if indeed it were foundationally and fundamentally uh, in a blockade situation, that almost like a Pavlov reflex, the one side would always say no to what the other side wants to do, regardless of how difficult or how, how, how uh, clear action is prescribed, then perhaps we could we could continue that discussion, but really it's not the case here. But, I mean that's where this gets so messy though, and when you're talking humanitarian intervention you see a real difference between the statements states make within the General Assembly or the Security Council and then the actions they actually take on the ground. So we have a raft of declarations and resolutions and reports telling us that humanitarian intervention may have some legs at international law, but when you look at actual practice on the ground, for every um, NATO intervention in Kosovo, you have a Rwanda or a defer where it just hasn't happened. Yes, I think we need to come back to the question of humanitarian intervention in a separate podcast, mm. but I think there's one interesting point 
here, um, apart from humanitarian intervention, and that is the reaction of quite a few states mm. to the use of this particular force. And that's been really interesting because there's been almost universal um, acceptance of what's happened, including from countries like um, Canada that have previously expressed reluctance about similar actions that the United States have perhaps taken in other countries. Yes, I noticed that as well, that uh, uh, sometimes even in legal language, sometimes in less legal language, mm -hmm. um, understanding was voiced, uh, the, the, the term proportional reaction mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, uh, and what was missing, uh, largely, though not entirely, because, for example, the Russian government um, said something else. But even the Russian government, I thought, and one would have to analyze what what exactly it is they they officially said, but even the Russian government put a lot of emphasis on the factual, the potential factual uh, uh, con controversy over whether it was actually the Syrian government mm -hmm. that and that therefore it might have been uh, uh, problematic, and didn't which from a hardcore perspective doesn't make any sense at all because from a hardcore perspective you'd say this is illegal. Uh, mm -hmm. We have no authorization of the Security Council. We do not have a self-defense organization, uh, full stop. Uh, the rest doesn't actually matter. So but that's the interesting part about even the way the United States have justified this action, because they haven't spoken about justifying it under Article 2, Subsection 4. They haven't used language of Security Council authorization or self-defense. They've spoken about proportionality and legitimate targets, and they've used very legal language but in an entirely different context to the actual legal question that you would think arises. Which legally then raises the question, are we perhaps witnessing, even if we were, even if we had to say now as we speak, there is no settled practice uh, for any use of force outside of the charter uh, exceptions. Mm -hmm. um, we've had that debate in the context of humanitarian intervention, now we have it in the context of a reaction to an atrocity namely the use of chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. Are we witnessing perhaps uh, the beginning or uh, a station on the road to mm -hmm. opening up potential exceptions to the strict prohibition of the use of force uh, in certain legal contexts that are regarded as particularly woeful or particularly grave or particularly bad? And of course, I think the international community is loath to go down that path with too much haste because obviously it's a Pandora's box. If you start to say the use of force can be used here and it can be used there, there's a whole range of questions that start to open up. But I think you're right. We're seeing in a very specific factual situation, perhaps the first in a number of steps that will ultimately lead us to look back and say there is now state practice to say this may be justified outside of the United Nations Charter. We'll see how this develops. Um, I think we have to close it down now, otherwise we're getting too long. One could continue to talk about these things for, uh, not forever perhaps, but for a very long time. <laughs> um, let's see what came out of it, and we'll be back here in the studio. Thank Absolutely. you, Lorraine. Thank you.